Hello, a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this session for designing impactful services and user experience. My name is Vicky, and for the next hour or so, I'll take you through some of my thoughts and experience in doing this. So just a little introduction of uh, NUS ISS. Um, as you probably know, um, we have been around for more than 40 years, and we do train a number of uh, professionals and uh, people in the industry. So we work very closely with clients, uh, corporate clients, as well as uh, government sector clients. And we also do masters in uh, technology. We have got four masters program, international program. And in the past few years, we have been embarking on blended learning programs as well. So feel free to chat a bit more about us um, if you want to know more about our programs. So, hello from Singapore. I wanted to show this picture because um, I'm a avid photographer and this is one of my favorite photos that I captured of Singapore. So, very warm welcome to everyone uh, to join this session. Just a quick introduction uh, about myself. My name is Vicky. Uh, I head up the Digital Innovation and Design Practice for NUS ISS. Um, before becoming an educator, I was actually a practitioner um, in various industries. So the areas that um, I've worked on in the industry will be areas in the Asia-Pacific region. I do customer experience, user experience, service design, digital marketing, e-commerce, customer acquisition, engagement, etc. And the industries I work in besides education is e-commerce, B2B, tourism, uh, consumer electronics and telecommunications. So in my role today, actually we work very closely with companies and corporates to help them in their digital transformation process. So my team and I, we use a lot of the design principles to help organizations in designing better experience for their customers. So today's topic, designing impactful services and user experience. First of all, why? Why do we need to design impactful services and user experience? I think it's quite self-explanatory in the sense that, number one, we do have a new type of consumer today, a new type of citizens, a new type of consumers who are very, very used to good and impactful services. Our consumers today are empowered by digital services and they have full information about the organization, sometimes maybe even more than ourselves. They are very tech-savvy, they like experiences, and they like to be collaborative and engaging as well. At the same time, they are influential and they like to be influenced as well. So with a consumer that is really very different breed from what we used to have, organizations have no choice but to catch up and keep up right, with what the consumers are expecting. Indeed, our empowered consumer demands a lot more. When I say a lot more, it's really a lot because, number one, they want choices. They like variety, right? They want to have options, and they do have options. And these options are across borders as well. Second, they want control. They want to know when they can do certain things and when they would like certain things. One example would be your Netflix. We now want to know exactly when we want to watch the shows. We do not want to be glued to the timetable of some broadcasting stations anymore. So we want that full control. Next is convenience. Everyone is so busy today. We want everything in one place. We want to do it quickly and hassle-free. And more. We want personalization. We want the organization to know who we are, what we want, and give us the most relevant information. Things that are irrelevant is going to be forgotten. And therefore, companies should strive right, to give customers a really good personalized experience based on what they know. And yet, we also want authenticity. We want the organizations to engage with us with an authentic voice and know us as an individual. At the same time, we also want privacy. We want our data to be saved. We want security. And best of all, we want a good experience in whatever we do. And organizations are all trying very hard to beat each other to provide that wonderful experience for the consumers. 
and every industry is becoming a service industry. This is regardless whether you're in manufacturing or whether you're producing physical goods previously. Even our shoes, for example, our sneakers, now have an app to go with it. So it's not lo no longer about a physical product. It's about the whole suite of services, solutions, and digital products that go with your physical products. And every industry is serving someone else, is providing value. As such, every industry is a service industry. Let's take a look at the top list of products and services that we see on the App Store. So this is the uh, top 25 list on the App Store recently. If you take a look at them, most of them are your products and services, then they are all digital. And some, in fact, some are digital only. So there's a whole myriad of options, a whole myriad of manufacturers, service provider, technology providers, that's giving consumers a lot of choice, a lot of options, and new ways of getting their day done and getting their jobs done in the day. So today, if you do not play in this space well enough as compared to the rest, you're going to lose out to a lot of these big players. And if you look at the list, most of them, or some of them, are actually global players. And this also means that our very exposed consumers and citizens are exposed to the level of standards that the global players have. And there lies the competition, if you like, for attention, for time, and for organizations to keep up, to engage and continue to get their consumers' interests. As we know, the customer or citizen is influenced by many things. The entire customer experience could be influenced by how your organization converse with them. It could be your communication style. It could be your content, the way you talk, and also who delivers the message. Another interaction is the sensory and atmospheric environment that the consumer deals with. So the logos they see, the advertisements, your representation, even the sound that they hear, right? A sonic identity or sonic brand, as we call it, influences how and what they think of the organization. Even smell and touch. Another area is your physical interactions. So those of you with the brands, with staff, with face-to-face -face services, be it events, exhibitions, or even your service counters, this is where the customers form the impressions of the end-to-end -end experience. And lastly, there's also shared experience. Consumer-to-consumer -consumer discussions in forums, for example, communities, word of mouth, reviews, all these are experiences not directly experienced by the consumer, but is somewhat shared by someone else. And a lot of times, we tend to take that right, as the experienced, um, that's, that is really filled by us. So the consumer, even though they don't experience this, they have that shared experience from someone else's that they may not even know. And all this will actually influence your brand. How many of us actually read the reviews of hotels or products before you buy? I'm sure most of us do, because we want to learn from someone else's experience. And for the better or worse, it actually influences the outcome for the brand. Also, influencers, media bloggers, stakeholder groups are additional voices that influences the consumer's choice. And lastly, the services itself. The way the digital service interaction works out the way they experience your website, your mobile, your kiosk experiences, all this influences the customer experience. So at the end of the day, experiences are shaped by the summation of how a customer feels across all their interactions with you. Indeed, across all their touch points, be it sometimes yours 
or someone else's touch point. At the end of the day, it's also the perceptions. So meaning, it, is, it may or may not be real. And perceptions are shaped by many things. It can be shaped by your functional experiences. For example, is it faster? Is it easier? Do I get my job done in a very simple way? Or do I have to jump through many hoops to get to buy something? It can also be emotional. Do you make me happy as I do the transaction? Do you make me feel reassured? And lastly, social. Do I feel appreciated by someone else by buying from you? Do I get admired by someone else? So all these are perceptions that influences your experience as a brand and it influences what the customers think of you. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to influence the perceptions, especially when your services are intangible. So one example I'd like to give you is about car servicing. So I've sent my car for servicing recently and I have no idea what service they did. I know how much I pay. I have the invoice that will tell me what was being done to my car. Right? But because I can't tell whether they changed my engine oil or not, whether they rotated my tires, I'm going to assume in good faith that they have done this. But what is tangible is this one. So this was a nice little touch. I'm going to zoom in. Right? Because of COVID, they actually added a little tag about the car is being sanitized for your safety. And this makes it very tangible all of a sudden. It feels like, okay, someone has cleaned my car, someone has made it very safe for me. Even though the actual intent of car servicing is to service the car, but because there was something explicit and tangible, the perception is that a good job has been done. So the consumers sync like synchronized end-to-end -end experiences. So it's no longer about individual products, about services, about your solutions, your support, ease of use, it's also about another whole suite of supporting resources. Whether you have education materials to teach them how to use the product better, whether you have resources that will help them if they run into trouble, whether you have a platform of third-party services to support them to maximise the use of your product. And your customer's experience is going to be across touch points, both owned, paid, earned, depends on your community, social media, forums, and the websites. As such, it is really important for us to take special care and attention in designing impactful services and user experience in every part of our journey. So today, I'm just going to share five tips about how can we design impactful services and user experience. First, derive deep user insights. Second, design with intent. Third, demonstrate, test, and iterate. And fourth, decide with data. And fifth, direct actions and change. If you, if you notice by now, they all start with the letter D. Uh, this is by design to help you remember. So let's just dive in into each one of them. The first one, deriving deep user insights. The first thing about deriving deep user insights is to have empathy. Empathy for the people that you are designing for. And what is empathy? Empathy is really understanding and feeling what the other person is experiencing. Empathy is putting yourself in someone's shoes, literally, feeling what they are feeling. And it's about seeing things from another person's perspective. Now, this is easy to say, but often very difficult to execute. So the first thing brands should learn to do is to really design in some opportunities, programs, to bring empathy into their employees, into their organization, such that there is a customer-centric approach when they make decisions regarding products, services, experiences. 
So why do we need empathy for customers? Well, it just makes good business sense that if you understand your customer more, the customers feel that you understand them and in the long run, they would like to stick with you for longer versus competition. And empathy for customers means you need to understand quite a number of things. The first one is motivation. What is their motivation of wanting to buy things from you? Often, our customers do not just buy products and services. They hire products and services for something else. They want something done. And what is that main motivation that the customers are looking for? For example, when you buy an airline ticket, are you just interested in the airline ticket? No. In fact, we are interested in the travel experience, not the ticket. So the motivation is very important for us to uncover. Next, their desires, their wants. What do they really need? Why do they enjoy that travel experience? Their views, their perceptions regarding travel, regarding going to another country. Their pain points, their pain points about how is the process of getting themselves to their end goal. What are the problems they face along the way? What are the barriers? And their needs. What do they need? The needs is of a family with small children, probably very different from a solo traveller or a business traveller. And emotions. How do they feel along the way? Did they have a happy journey? Or did they have a very painful one to get to their destination? At the end of the day, by doing qualitative research, we could understand a lot more about customers. And this is fundamental for us to design impactful services and experience. And how do we do that? So usually we derive insights from users when we have conversations with them. Through our conversations with the right users, we gather information and we gather insights. And these insights are so critical because they op represent opportunities for us to innovate and opportunities for us to do better. You can do this through multiple ways, through in-depth interviews, observations, studies, emerging, immersing yourself in the entire experience itself. All these methods allow you to uncover new opportunities. It allows you to validate new value proposition or even inform product and marketing strategy. There's a few areas of the customer's true needs that we would like to share. There are the needs on the functional level, emotional level, as well as aspiration level. So if you do your user research well, and if you really truly understand your customers, you will be able to know what they're looking for. For example, are they looking for a faster service, easier, better? Are they looking for variety or a simple, organized way? The other side of the coin is where you look at reduction of effort, avoidance of hassles, reduce risk, reduce error, and reduce cost. Do you help customers do that? Does your product and services help customers do things faster, easier? Do you help them reduce their risk? On the emotional side, sometimes customers are looking for fun, aesthetically pleasing experience, maybe a therapeutic experience, nostalgia, or it could be status or rewards. On the other side, they could be read looking to reduce anxiety or looking to you to provide assurance that they are doing it right. And lastly, on the aspirational front, it's about the motivation and the social impact that they can get by working with you. So, by looking at all these deep values and true needs of the customers, you will be able to design your product and services better. Let me give you another example. So, 
it's the end of the year and I'm going holiday for travel. And one of the things that you do and I do is to buy travel insurance. Now, so in my travel insurance purchase experience, I had a rather easy way of selecting the travel insurance. Um, I compare a few providers, I look at the website, and this particular travel insurer um, has a pretty good website that allows me to make decisions quite quickly. They have different packages, they explain to you what of the features of the packages, they have the pricing being transparent on the website, and in fact, I could easily buy off the site. So it's almost like an e-commerce transaction, you could buy travel insurance via the online channel, which is what I did. And in short, the provider satisfy my functional needs of buying a travel insurance. However, the story doesn't end there. So after I click the buy button, pay using my credit card, as a normal consumer, my expectation is I would like some confirmation. Remember, I buy the travel insurance to get assurance that I'm covered during my trip. And the strange thing is I did not receive any confirmation that my travel insurance has been purchased. I checked my emails, there wasn't. I waited for a couple of hours, I checked again, there was no email. And I was kind of left hanging, wondering, did I buy my insurance or not? Did it go through? Has it got approved? I have no idea. So guess what? In the end, I have to write an email to the agent and ask them. Now, this of course creates unnecessary work for the travel agent. Eventually, the insurance policy did arrive a few days later in my email. Probably a bit faster than the travel insurance care line replied to me. So I was happy, that was fine, but so much could be done from the travel insurance provider perspective. What they failed to understand was the emotional need of buying the travel insurance. And the fact that I did it on the online channel where everything is self-service, quick and immediate. There is expectations that I should get confirmation quickly, immediately and almost instantaneously. Because if they had understand my emotional jobs, the emotional needs to feel assured that this thing did go through, they would have done a lot better in the communications and to make the whole experience all the more pleasant and at the same time save themselves some work having to reply to customers. So the second tip I would like to share is to design with intent. Nothing is created out of the blue. Every experience and every service, every product is designed with a full intention in mind. Before that, I'd like to probably explain a little bit of difference between these commonly used terms. Service design, CX customer experience, UX user experience, and UI. You may ask, what is the difference between all these terms? And indeed, for someone who's new to this, you may find it a little bit confusing. So let me explain using a restaurant example. So imagine you go to a restaurant and after settling down at your table, the first thing you do is say you want to order your food. And today, you could order it via a QR code or, for example, an iPad. The UI and UX component is usually focused very much on the digital device itself. So UI is in terms of the user interface, how the app looks, how the buttons are laid out, how the visuals and the hierarchy of your food is being organized. That's UI. The UX is the end-to-end -end experience of working with that digital interface. Whether it is easy for you to add to cart, easy for you to change your order, easy for you to know that you have indeed placed your order. So all that is pretty much concentrated on the digital interface. Customer experience, however, 
is a little bit broader than that. Customer experience includes things that are beyond your digital interfaces. It includes the ambience of the restaurant, includes the taste of the food, the service of the staff, as well as your whole atmosphere and experience for the entire dining time. And sometimes the customer experience may be influenced by factors outside of your choice. Say for example, the next table decides to make a lot of noise and that actually affects your customer experience. Service design goes beyond the customer's anger. It actually looks at behind the scenes. It looks at the work processes, the way your organization is being structured, how you deliver the service to the customers. So it's important to clearly understand when you're designing your experiences, which part of this are you looking at? Are you looking at the user experience of your digital touch points? Are you looking at the end-to-end -end customer experience? Or are you looking at service design, which involves marrying the front stage and the backstage of the entire experience itself? And all this requires different tools, techniques, and methodology. So one of the methodology we use quite a lot here is uh, design thinking, and we used it to solve many of the problems I described earlier. We help organizations to really deep dive into what their consumers are looking for and help them to design with intent, be it their user experience, customer experience, or service design. And often we want to leverage on quite a number of design principles for example, we like multidisciplinary expertise. And having a mixed bag of people coming in from different cultures, different backgrounds, actually makes the whole experience a lot richer. And indeed, they actually produce better outcomes. The next is we like to drive collaborations. So there's tools, techniques to drive collaborations, alignment, discussions, debate among the various teams. And this is really beneficial if you are trying to design something for the customers. If there's no debate, you're probably not getting very far. And with the diverse team and collaborations, there is so much more and that you can design together. We use time as a material. We give time constraints. We have a time in terms of how we want to design that experience. We use it effectively to drive and iterate. Visualization, a lot of techniques and methods are being used to help people visualize what they're designing. And the whole process is iterative. There is a lot of chance to work together. There's a lot of chance to rework, if you like, or to iterate on the previous solutions. And this is part and parcel of designing experience. The value of using this approach First of all, is we are very human-centric. It means that we, first of all, take care of whether the consumers and your citizens desire your products. So that desirability piece is very strongly uh, embedded. It allows us to solve some real problems using a very structured approach. It allows us to focus and be efficient as well in working together and then get things aligned and getting things done. At the same time, it gives opportunities to improve and iterate. It is a form of de-risking by testing, validating, and checking that what we designed is indeed desirable. At the end of the day, we leverage on the structured process, tools, and methods. Let me give you another example. In this case, this is a hotel booking experience. This hotel app understands the end-to-end -end process of going on a holiday, and they play in this space of helping you make the holiday easier in terms of accommodations. So in the first place, you can see that they start with search. It is easy to find the products. The findability is excellent. It is easy for you to save your favorites into a list so that you can consider, so it helps you in the consideration process. 
And after that, if you have questions, so in the consideration process, you may have queries, you may have things to clarify with the hotel itself. There's an in-app messaging where you can message the hotel directly. And indeed, you can read previous questions from other travellers to set your doubts in place. Now, all these are intentional to help you in your decision-making process so that eventually you will do the booking. Now, but this is not the end. Often, companies only look at up to purchase and book, but that's not the end of the consumer's journey. Consumers are actually looking for much more. It has to be end-to-end. -end. So in this case, they also provide a confirmation of all your bookings in one place. Indeed, they nudge you a little bit. If you have not, if you book for day one and day three and you forgot day two, they will actually inform you. So that will help you in terms of organizing all your bookings in a single place. At the same time, they will allow changes for you to update, edit, or even cancel. And at the end, if you choose to rebook, you are able to find your history, all the previous hotels that you have booked before. And then the journey kind of repeats itself. So by thinking through the whole journey of what a consumer customer needs in their travel, in their booking, they actually provide and deliver a whole series of experiences and features to help you in that journey itself. Similarly, a lot of products and services out there make use of nudges. So nudges are little things that is inbuilt into the products and services to allow you to make little decisions along the way or in the decisions that they want along the way. So they would like to push you to a certain direction of your decision making. Say for example, your health apps. Looking at your health apps by telling you how many steps you have done, by telling you you are a little bit far from your goal, you need to do a bit more, they are actually nudging you a little bit further. Similarly for rewards or for shopping apps. More examples, for example from the government, from LTA, using social norms to nudge you a little bit to pay your road tax on time. They tell you that 9 out of 10 of the Singapore taxpayers renew their road tax on time. So would you like to be the 1 out of the 10? Maybe not. What about health promotion board? Telling you what is healthy, having labels and heuristics to help you make a decision whether this is indeed a healthier choice. And NEA, having that ticks about energy saving on your aircon, for example, it allows you to make decisions to be environmentally friendly. The last one, appeal to social norms again for you to clear your trays after eating. So all these are subtle messaging nudges that help in the whole design process. And this is built into the product and experience itself. Now, the opposite of a nudge is what we call a sludge. Sludge means you create friction. So a nudge allows you to make it easier to get things done. Sludge makes it harder. So one example we had was this case where we purchased some items from an e-commerce store we would like to purchase this and there was missing items in the delivery. And so what we did was we wrote in to them and said, hey, there are missing items in your delivery. I would like a refund. And guess what? The helpline came back and told us that, hey, this incident was reported more than 12 hours after the delivery was completed. And so we regret to inform you that we are unable to issue you a refund. And then all the reports on such orders to be made within 12 hours of the order. Now, how would we as consumer know that they have such a policy in place? Does anyone of us read the fine prints about when must you report about a missing order? No, right? So it's kind of natural that 
we miss this about the 12 hours. But by having this in place, this is creating unnecessarily friction and sludge, if you like, in the whole process. It makes the customer experience poor because the customer's expectations are not met through no fault of theirs and there's no recourse. So think about the kind of sludge that you do have today in your legacy systems, in your products, services, your policies, and the decisions that you're making. Does it make life easier for the consumers? Or does it make life harder? Now, this is another side of sludge. You may have read in the news that the banks now allow consumers to lock up their funds in a digital vault. And in this digital vault, it is very difficult to withdraw your money. So the benefit of this is, because it's hard for you to withdraw the money, if you're being scammed, it is very hard for you to give your money to the scammers as well. Now, this is a form of sludge. Is this for the better? Maybe, for some people. Right? But it's a deliberate intent to design it that way in order to fight against scams. So the third area that I'd like to share is about demonstrate, test and iterate your product and services. Indeed, we often suggest that we use things like props, visualization, modeling, prototyping to share your ideas with a larger group. It is a much easier way to communicate your intent and the service experience. There's an online version as well for prototyping. So this whole test and learn iterate process is quite important when it comes to designing products and services, especially digital ones. Because often you can get so much information from the first version that you have designed and if you do validate and test with your customers, you get so much insights that you can often produce a better service. One example of a product I'd like to share is Miro. Some of you may be familiar with this product. Miro is a company that focuses on one thing and they do it very well. It's almost like a digital whiteboard. We use Miro quite a lot during the COVID when we were doing our classes remotely. So instead of using post-its on our whiteboard, we use Miro, which is a digital version of an endless whiteboard. This company focuses a lot on collaboration using visualization. And to date, I'm surprised they have 35 million users across the world and 130,000 clients. They also have 100,000, 100 apps integration and over 300 templates sorted by use case, techniques, and by teams. So because I'm a regular user of this, I do notice that they constantly do product iterations. In fact, my team and I, every time we go in to Miro, we realize that something new has happened. They may have a new feature for brainstorming or ideation. They may have a new template or a new design. And all this allows them to really meet the needs of their customers. And in this case, the customers who use this tool are people in the product design, people in the UX design, agile, project delivery, right? Our tech stack integration. So this tool as a visualization collaborative tool allows for remote hybrid working collaborations across borders. It allows people who are working from home to work with people from working from the office at the same time. And as a product, it keeps understanding the users, iterating its features so that the users will find it more and more useful. Another example from the government is the parents' gateway. Some of us are parents, we may have used this. This essentially started as a tool for communications between the school administrators and the parents. The original intent was to reduce the paperwork between teachers, school, and the parents. 
So we recall the time when our children have to bring home little slips of paper, consent form for the parents to sign. So this tool itself has also iterated many times. There's actually many versions of the tool. It has moved from different scope of the education sector into the other sectors as well. It started with a few schools and then it iterated the features into more schools. So it is still growing and constantly evolving as a product. One of the other examples that we like to share is about tapping on your community for ideas. So this is something that we do, Design for Impact. In fact, we have done it for three iterations. My colleagues run this program, Designathon, together with MOHT, um, the Design Council, as well as the NCSS. So with this, we actually tap on the ideas from the community itself, from the healthcare sector and beyond. And with the ideas from the community, you could actually iterate and improve on the services and experiences that we produce. Number four, decide with data. Data is oil, right? It's the fuel for all the interactions that we have with our customers and the experience. And there's so much data that we can collect. The question is, how do we use them? There are multiple sources of data. For example, qualitative data, quantitative, business impact data, I call them broadly. Qualitative data includes your user research, user feedback, Net Promoter Score Sentiments, Social Media Listening, Brand Preference. Quantitative data, you have a whole myriad of them, be it from analytics, looking at your downloads, active users, your behavior data, what exactly customers do, interaction data. And then the business impact data, your financials, your user acquisition, engagement, retention numbers, etc. So there's a whole lot of data out there that absolutely helps us in making better decisions. So one example I'd like to share with you is in the e-commerce sector. So in this B2B e-commerce electronic distributor, we use data a lot for decision making in terms of product stocking, in terms of how we can add value in terms of the experiences we provide the engineers, in terms of the engagement tactics that we can use to engage our engineers and procurement people that is actually buying these products. So data is used in decision making in multiple steps of the way. Another example which you are probably familiar is TikTok. TikTok is now 1.218 billion monthly active users as of last month from Statiska. Now I remember about four years, five years ago, when I started to look at the social media trends and active users, TikTok was nowhere near. And in a short five years, they have actually grown to one of the top few apps in social media. And the question is why and how? How did they do this? Right? First of all, they have a very good selling proposition. They are about short form videos, and it's about shareability, user created content, and community building. And they do this with a lot of data. For example, for consumers, they have a For You page. Not only does it have an intuitive user interface, it has a very good algorithm. It's a deep user understanding of what you like, what you do, what kind of content you interact with, what kind of behavior you exhibit. And therefore, they will serve you the right kind of content. That will keep you going. I guess many of us may be having this experience of being stuck on TikTok for hours the moment you start. It actually helps you to predict the videos that will get your interest. So instead of waiting for you to choose the videos, it predicts the one that will give you um, interest. It pre predicts the one and the experiment with the ones that they think you would like. Of course, they test and iterate along the way, and they change the algorithm as well. And in fact, a lot of people use TikTok today more than just for entertainment. We use it like a search engine or even product recommendations. Because beyond entertainment, there's actually some educational value that we learn from TikTok. For example, little life hacks, little tips on how to cook, it's all available there. 
Now, but that's not the end of the equation. The other side is the creators. So TikTok is like a platform. So on the creator side, the ease of creation and the fact that there's an audience for your creation is really important. So for creators, there's music integration. And that, of course, helps to fuel that music viral trends. There are creative tools like filters, effects, overlays. And this helps it very, very easy for anyone to go into production of video. They encourage experimentation. They make it easy for you to try. And every video gets served to someone at least once. And they give you a ready audience. Obviously, there's also authenticity and engagement. So all these kind of help to make you th the TikTok a really fun and shareable video sharing social media apps. And lastly, that's where the users get the value. They get the value from being entertained. They get the video from being educated at the same time. Another example I'd like to share is about getting feedback. So this is our sync past. If you recall, one of the features that the sync past added a couple of months back, probably, is about viewing your NRIC on the sync pass app. I remember when they first started to have this feature, I kind of was one of the first few to saw this, to see this, and the NRIC was actually exposed directly, if you remember. And being a consumer, I was a little bit concerned and shocked. Like, why is my NRIC there? I don't really want to see my NRIC details when I open the app. And at the same time, they were very proactive in taking feedback. So there was actually a, a feedback form that you could write in. They take actively feedback from the app store as well. So what I did was I actually wrote in. I wrote in to the same pass and said, hey, I do not want my NRIC to be visible the first time I log in. Can you all do something about this? And lo and behold, after a couple of weeks, in fact, they introduced the feature where the NRIC can be chose, you can choose to hide it and only expose it with a pin later on. So this feature was very quickly iterated and improved on. I was pleasantly surprised. So when I met the product person in charge of this, I actually commented to him. I said, oh, wow, you guys actually take the feedback. And he said, yes, they actually look at the feedback from the app stores, they look at feedback from the citizens, and they try to iterate and improve along the way. Number five, direct actions and change. This is the last step of making sure that your services and user experience can be carried through and supported. The first thing I ask is, why do your consumers call? Do you know why they call you? Often organizations think the consumers call regarding a specific case. Maybe they have a problem, maybe they have a support issue, etc. But how many of us actually deep dive and look into the real reasons and the behind the scenes of why consumers call you? In the short term, you may be solving on a case by case resolution. But if you dive deeper, you can actually uncover customer experience and problem areas. And what is more valuable is to uncover the root cause. In the longer term, you can even identify trends, opportunities, and that may give you ideas for new policies, new process, or even implementing new technologies. In fact, you may even have to change the way you work, your incentives, and your organizational structure. So this is no easy change, but if you really deep dive, and you are really serious about creating impactful experiences, you will have to go beyond just the customer service and the front line. So the customer service is just the tip of the iceberg. To really deliver your customer-facing service, product services, you need to go behind the scenes. There's a whole lot of work that needs to happen behind the scenes from different departments, different teams, and often alignment and collaboration among the teams. So this is the next step, which is very important to drive actions and actual deliverables. It's that whole synchronization behind the scenes. 
One example and trend that's happening on the, um, on the government side is this thing about a live event-based service delivery. So all citizens go through live events from birth to school to graduation, working, marriage, setting up your own business, and finally retirement and death. So from cradle to grave, there is specific milestones that we all go through in life. And governments across the world have been also looking at this. How do they deliver a service based on live events of the citizens? And in fact, for our Singapore, we have Life SG that's doing the same thing. Starting from register for your birth, applying for baby bonus, to the rest of the journeys, they are looking at this from the perspective of the citizens. Now, to do this is no easy feat because what you're doing essentially is trying to make life easier right, for your citizens at different milestones. But it requires you to do a lot of behind-the-scenes work. So imagine working across teams, working across agencies, aligning process, aligning the way things are being delivered, combining stuff, removing stuff. All these require mindset change, a lot of collaboration, and a lot of hard work behind the scenes. And if you do this well, this is where you truly deliver good customer experience. So I'd like to leave with you the five Ds. Derive deep user insights, design with intent, demonstrate, test, iterate, decide with data, direct actions and change. And together, these tips will help you design impactful services and user experience.